In most of our other talks, we've discussed how to approach the interpretation of imaging studies. In this talk, we'll tackle how to choose what that imaging study should be. When we image the chest, the most common studies we perform are chest x-rays, chest CTs, and chest MRIs. Chest x-rays are fast, inexpensive, widely accessible, and can be done at the patient's bedside when needed. Chest x-ray images also have high spatial resolution. On the downside, chest x-rays are basically a summation chattogram where three dimensions get collapsed into two, which can sometimes make it difficult to understand what's going on anatomically. We also have to expose patients to ionizing radiation in order to obtain a chest x-ray image. Chest CTs, on the other hand, provide us with a much, much better way of understanding what's going on inside a patient, since we're able to appreciate the three-dimensional anatomy of the patient. Chest CTs are a relatively accessible study, though nowhere as accessible as chest x-rays are. And even though they are relatively accessible, the CT machine usually can't come to the patient, so the patient must be stable enough to be wheeled all the way to the CT machine, transferred onto the table, scanned, transferred off of the table, and then wheeled all the way back again. Chest CT studies are a much more expensive imaging study than chest x-rays, and they involve a much higher dose of ionizing radiation exposure too. Chest MRIs involve no ionizing radiation exposure since the modality works by magnetic fields and radio waves. However, because of the strong magnetic field necessary to create MR images, patients with some metal devices, implants, or foreign bodies can't enter um, a MRI machine safely. The tube in which a patient lies during an MRI can be a very noisy and claustrophobic place too. And MRI studies take much, much longer than chest x-rays or chest CTs to complete, often 30 minutes or more. Chest MRIs are also very expensive and less accessible than chest CT or chest x-rays. However, we put up with all of these limitations since chest MRI can give us a really nice way of distinguishing different types of soft tissue from each other, often with much more specificity than CT. MRI does fall short of CT though in a couple of ways. Its spatial resolution is worse than CT and it doesn't do as well at imaging air containing structures like the lungs. So how do we choose the best chest imaging study for our patients? Let's begin with chest x-rays. There are many situations where a chest x-ray alone is enough to direct management. Four situations that quickly come to mind are verifying the position of lines and tubes, like this feeding tube that's been accidentally inserted into a patient's lung, pneumothoraces, pleural effusions, and fractures. These are situations for which chest x-rays are often both sensitive and specific. There are some other situations in which chest x-rays are enough to direct management, such as this patient with COVID pneumonia in an emergency room at the height of the pandemic, or this patient with pulmonary edema in the setting of known heart failure. These are two examples of situations where chest x-rays might be so-so in specificity and sensitivity, but can reasonably endorse an already clinically suspected diagnosis. And finally, there are situations where what we're looking for um, is a disease um, that might involve a gold standard test that's perhaps cost prohibitive to run on every potential patient, but for which chest x-rays can serve as an inexpensive first-line screening test, like in the situation with tuberculosis or occupational lung diseases like coworkers pneumoconiosis um, or lymphoma and other malignancy um, searches related to exposure to military herbicides like Agent Orange. So these are some of the most common situations where a chest x-ray alone is often an appropriate study um, rather than chest CT or chest MRI. So when may a chest x-ray not be enough? Take this example of a trauma patient with an unusual opacity in their lower left chest. There are many potential explanations for this sort of chest x-ray opacity, and the x-ray doesn't really help establish which one is more likely. However, seeing the three-dimensional relationships in this region by CT allows us to understand this opacity represents abdominal organs that have herniated into the lower left chest through a traumatic diaphragm rupture. Or take this example, where a patient had a chest x-ray that didn't look all that different from a chest x-ray from three years earlier, when in actuality, they had a ruptured thoracic aortic dissection involving their ascending aorta.
or this third example, where we have an ill immunosuppressed man with poorly controlled diabetes who has a seemingly unremarkable looking chest x-ray. His chest x-ray would only become visibly abnormal after things got floridly um, out of control several days later and multiple lung masses had seemingly appeared out of nowhere, while which uh, on CT imaging were finally revealed to be very suspicious for a case of mucormycosis, a highly aggressive fungal infection that spread to this patient's brain, uh, causing a severe bleed that resulted in his death. So chest x-rays may not be ideal in scenarios where things can quickly spiral out of control, but not be initially obvious on the two-dimensional shatograms we call chest x-rays. Situations like trauma, acute aortic disease, and lung infections in very sick patients. There are blind spots on chest x-rays too that could easily hide metastases like in this patient with osteosarcoma that spread to the lung. So chest x-rays may also not be ideal in settings where what you're hunting for might be hidden on one of chest x-rays blind spots. Then there are cases where chest x-ray may have been an appropriate and necessary first line study but not sufficient when the patient's course begins to go in an unexpected direction. Like in this case, where a patient presented with shortness of breath, chest pain, a low-grade fever, and a lower right lung opacity. Folks in the ED had a high clinical suspicion for pneumonia, for which the chest x-ray was concordant. However, the patient did not improve over the next few days and returned later when a chest CT ultimately showed that the patient actually had a pulmonary infarct in their lower right lung from a PE, and not pneumonia. So while chest x-rays may be a reasonable and necessary first line exam for many cases, they may not be enough when the clinical course of a patient begins to diverge from expected. And of course, there are gonna be times where an abnormal and concerning finding is accurately identified on a chest x-ray, but when the chest x-ray alone is not enough for us to understand the cause. Like in this case where soft tissue masses are visible in the left chest, which the CT shows nicely, in addition to evidence of a remote left diaphragm injury, injury and the absence of a spleen, that led us to obtain a nuclear medicine study confirming our suspicion that the chest masses were a case of post-traumatic intrathoracic splenosis. So while chest x-rays may accurately identify an abnormality, sometimes they can't provide us with enough information um, to understand what the cause of the abnormality is. So we need to recognize some of the common scenarios where a chest x-ray is not enough. Uh, settings for where chest x-ray may not be sensitive for the problem, um, for a problem that could rapidly spin out of control, or for when you're hunting for metastases, or when the x-ray does its expected job, but the diagnostic process is not finished. In these circumstances, where the result of the chest x-ray alone is not enough to drive management, we'll usually rely on chest CT. But which kind do you order? As I see it, there are basically five kinds of chest CTs. Standard, non-contrast chest CTs, high-resolution ILD protocol, non-contrast chest CTs, low-dose non-contrast chest CTs, standard contrast-enhanced chest CTs, and CT angiograms of the chest. Standard radiation dose non-contrast chest CTs are usually the most common kind of chest CT we do. They're performed with no IV contrast and usually done where what we're looking for is inherently different in attenuation from its background, like a solid lung nozzle within a sea of air-filled lung parenchyma, or bone within a background of fat and muscle. In the absence of IV contrast, um, most soft tissues, however, will appear as somewhat similar shades of gray, which can sometimes impair our sensitivity and specificity for picking up some disorders. That being said, um, standard non-contrast chest CTs are great for assessing the airways, like in this case of trachopapillomatosis, um, assessing lung masses like this mycetoma, assessing lung nozzles like this left lower lobe granuloma, and measuring the severity of um, this case of pectus excavatum involving the um, ribcage. And even though um, the soft tissue structures may all appear in similar shades of gray on non-contrast CT imaging, that doesn't mean we can't look at the shape and contours 
of anatomy to diagnose findings like this double aortic arch in a patient with mediastinal fullness on chest x-ray. So standard non-contrast chest CT is usually good for characterizing airways, lung nodules, lung infections, um, particularly in um, um, more um, kind of typical patients. Basic aortic diameter uh, measurements, variant anatomy, and the thoracic skeleton. High resolution, or what we prefer to refer to as ILD protocol, non-contrast chest CTs are performed without IV contrast. The name high resolution is an artifact of the late 20th century when standard non-contrast chest CTs consisted of contiguous 5 or 7 millimeter thick CT slices, while chest CTs done for ILD would consist of non-contiguous 1 millimeter thin CT slices. With the advent of multi-detector CT machines over two decades ago, standard non-contrast chest CTs these days are also usually done at one millimeter slice thickness. So standard CTs have the same spatial resolution as um, the CTs we refer to as high-res CTs. And that's why um, we refer to these studies as ILD protocol um, chest CTs these days. ILD protocol chest CTs um, do differ from standard non-contrast chest CTs, um, not in their resolution, but by the fact that we'll usually do an additional acquisition of the patient in end expiration, and sometimes also one in the prone position, while with standard chest CTs, um, we obtain a single acquisition with the patient in a supine position at end inspiration. The presence of an expiratory phase allows us to identify the presence of ear trapping, which can be useful in nailing down uh, a more specific diagnosis in some ILD cases or uh, lung transplant patients, uh, in addition to identifying other disorders that are exacerbated during the expiratory phase, like trachea Prone images are sometimes included, since it can be sometimes difficult to tell if subtle opacities along the posterior margin of a lower lobe are true interstitial fibrosis or just a little dependent atelectasis. By flipping this patient over, we can tell the opacities, um, in this case, are true interstitial fibrosis since the opacities would have gone away if they were a dependent atelectasis. So ILD protocol chest CTs are usually good for interstitial lung disease, air trapping, and dynamic airway collapse. Since air trapping and dynamic airway collapse are features we also look for when assessing uh, for lung transplant complications, that means ILD protocol chest CTs are preferred when imaging many lung transplant patients too. Low-dose chest CTs are performed without IV contrast uh, using a lower amount of radiation than standard non-contrast chest CTs. This results in a noisier image, which may somewhat interpair our ability to assess the soft tissue structures, but generally still permits us to, to assess the lungs, particularly for things like lung nodules. In this example of two non-contrast chest CTs, the image on your left was a standard dose image, while the image on your right is a low dose image. You can see that although the low dose image is a lot noisier, we're still able to make out both larger objects like the fungal infection site here and smaller objects like the tiny peripheral lung vessels um, on the low dose image. We prefer low dose imaging when the suspicion for cancer in a patient is fairly low. Uh, the kind of cases where the potential downsides of radiation exposure um, from a standard dose um, CT actually become significant relative to the upsides of doing the imaging. Typical settings um, are lung cancer screening and Fleischner follow-ups of small incidental lung nodules. Another setting where we prefer low-dose chest CT uh, would be the pediatric population as well, like in this 11-year-old with meandering pulmonary veins. So low-dose chest CTs are generally used for a lung nodule follow-up in adults with no prior history malignancy, such as in the setting of lung cancer screening and Fleischner follow-up of incidental lung nodules. Uh, Low-dose chest CTs are also preferred in pediatric populations too. Standard contrast-enhanced chest CTs are performed with intravenous contrast and give us an opportunity to see how certain soft tissue opacities, particularly abnormal ones, vary relative to other soft tissue opacities. Take this example here. While there's clearly an abnormal soft tissue opacity present in the anterior left chest on this non-contrast chest CT image, the use of intravenous contrast allows us to identify and understand more clearly what's going on, that we have a central left lung mass indicated by the yellow arrow abutting the left pulmonary artery that causes obstructive left upper lobe atelectasis peripherally 
uh, indicated by the blue arrows. The use of IV contrasts may help clue us in that the particular area of soft tissue outlined in yellow here on this image is not actually liver, but pleural metastases pushing against liver. Or that the weird looking opacities in the mediastinum here are actually enlarged collateral arteries. Or that the mild hyalur enlargement on this non-contrast chest CT image is not caused by pulmonary artery enlargement, but rather by enlarged lymph nodes. Contrast can also make abnormalities more conspicuous and easier to detect too. What may seem like an unremarkable appearing non-contrast chest CT at first glance may actually be hiding a mass that's much easier to catch um, on an enhanced CT image. So standard contrast enhanced chest CTs are generally preferred for situations where a solid organ or solid or uh, soft tissue abnormalities may be present. Um, situations like malignancy, trauma, pleural disorders, mediastinal disorders, lymphoproliferative disorders, and chest wall disorders. CT angiography studies, like standard contrast enhanced chest CT studies, are performed with intravenous contrast. However, CT angio studies are carefully timed so that most of the contrast hasn't left the blood vessels yet and are still situated specifically within the blood vessels of interest, for example, the pulmonary arteries or the thoracic aorta. This is different from standard enhanced chest CTs where more time has elapsed such that most of the contrast has actually left the vascular space and has moved into the extravascular, extracellular spaces. CT angio studies allow us to view patency and caliber of the lumen of blood vessels, um, allowing us to recognize that, for example, this patient with a fairly unremarkable appearing chest x-ray actually had pronounced thromboembolic disease preventing perfusion of the pulmonary arteries in their lower right lung, or allowing us to learn that all of this patient had a relatively unremarkable appearing thoracic aorta on a standard contrast enhanced chest CT, that a type A aortic dissection was actually present requiring immediate surgical attention, or that the source of this patient's left hemothorax was actually a traumatic tear of the thoracic aorta. So CT angiography of the chest is an excellent study when a disorder of the pulmonary arteries or thoracic aorta is suspected. So we prefer chest CT in all of the situations where a chest x-ray is not enough. And here's a summary of the kind of chest CT to consider for the issue at hand. And I want to mention two important points. With the exception of some aortic CTAs, there's almost never a reason to do a chest CT with and without contrast. Speaking as a chest radiologist, having a non-contrast CT to refer to when we're reading a contrast enhanced chest CT almost never adds any value when it's a non-vascular case. The second point is to take this chart with a grain of salt. In the real world, we can often, though not always, answer the clinical question even if the wrong kind of chest CT was done. For example, we usually can do a good job with ILD on modern non-ILD protocol chest CTs. And we can usually do a good job with the majority of malignancies on non-contrast chest CT too. Okay, so we've tackled chest X-ray and chest CT. Now let's move on to chest MRI. When is it time to consider ordering a chest MRI? I'd say it's primarily boils down to mediastinal masses and chest wall disorders for which chest CT is indeterminate. Take for example, this low attenuation mediastinal mass that's of slightly higher attenuation than simple fluid. Is this a tumor or is it a proteinaceous cyst? The chest CT can't answer this question and the FDG PET CT imaging in this particular case was inconclusive too. However, the appearance of this mass on a short tau inversion recovery MRI sequence was enough to allow us to, de to definitively characterize this as a benign mediastinal cyst, saving the patient from an invasive procedure. Or take this patient, who developed a sudden change in the appearance of two contiguous thoracic vertebral bodies in a six-week interval that looked like this on chest CT. However, the chest CT could not conclusively tell us if this was a consequence of infection or cancer. With MRI, we are able to study these vertebral bodies much better and understand that this was a case of osteomyelitis and infectious discitis rather than malignancy. So we consider non-cardiac chest MRI in the setting of mediastinal masses and chest wall um, disorders for which 
CT is inconclusive. And that's how we choose the best chest imaging study for our patients. Um, and here's a final TLDR slide that captures most of what we've discovered, discussed um, on a single slide.